My name is Nicholas Kovach. My um, advisor is Lauren Williams at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. And my talk is titled Frozen in Time, the History of Proteins. Um, so I guess let's just jump right in. I'll just do a brief central dogma again. Um, so as you can see here, here DNA is in yellow and DNA is transcribed by a polymerase, an enzyme. Um, into ribonucleic acid, RNA. And then the ribosome is a site of translation where we go from RNA and we have peptide bond, um, polypeptides formed, proteins. So the ribosome is very unique. Um, not only is it a very large macromolecular structure, but it's made of RNA and it's made of protein. Um, right here, I have the small subunit on the left-hand side and the large subunit on the right-hand side. RNA is in pink and yellow, whereas ribosomal proteins are in blue. Um, and as you can see right here, this little green dot, that is where uh, peptide bonds are formed, where proteins are made. And that is surrounded entirely by RNA. And so the catalytic function of the ribosome is purely RNA. Proteins are not needed actually for the catalysis of peptide bonds within the ribosome. It's a ribozyme. Um, so the ribosome, like I said, its input is RNA and its output is protein. Another way of saying that is its input is nucleic acid polymers and its output is amino acid polymers. Or another way again of saying it is that its input is information encoded on RNA and its output is function, proteins. Proteins go on to carry out all the catalytic and metabolic functions of the cell. Um, so in 2009, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Venki Ramakrishnan, Thomas Stites, and Adi Yonath for their studies of the structure and function of the ribosome. Um, here's just a quick little gif of the ribosome just to show you how complicated of a machine this is. On the bottom, you can see the small subunit in pink, and the blue is mRNA, which is being red. Uh, then you have blue, green, and red, which are the tRNAs, and they're bringing in the, um, the amino acids, which are then being brought right to the center of the large subunit, where they are being, uh, where pe peptide bonds are formed. And then out the back of the ribosome is where the protein um, emerges. And the protein is emerging through the exit tunnel. So quickly, just a little bit about protein structure. So when the polypeptide is coming out of the exit tunnel of the ribosome, it's coming out as just a sequence of amino acids. And then the way that a protein then folds from that polypeptide sequence is it first forms secondary structures, such as alpha helices and beta strands. And those are formed by hydrogen bonds between the amino acids. And then those secondary structures go on to um, aggregate next to each other to form globular proteins, which then have function. And so these proteins can then go throughout the cell and catalyze um, reactions. Um, and then sometimes these um, polypeptide chains form together to form like trimeric, multimeric proteins, which are then functional on their own. Um, so Dr. Akonuma was talking about nucleoside diphosphate kinase. And that is an example of a cellular protein. Um, and as you can see, proteins have a globular, um, they're just a globular domain um, that's made up of alpha helices and beta sheets. Um, however, when you look at the ribosome and the proteins of the ribosome, you see that they also have these globular domains that look just like pretty much all cellular proteins, whether they're in the cytosol or in membrane bound. But then ribosomal proteins also have these really unique characteristics of having these tails that are unstructured or have very little secondary structure. And it's these tails that are embedded deep within ribosomal RNA. It's th these structures are on the surface of the ribosome, whereas these tails are penetrating deep down into the ribosome and getting very close to the PTC, the peptidyl transferase center. So going back to ribosomal RNA, Catherine presented this, um, a fine-grained evolution, evolution of RNA where you have 
RNA helices accreting onto the surface of the ribosome as the ribosome grew. And there's 59 of these in the large subunit. Um, I'm I kind of just want to do a little more coarse grain um, just because that's a little too complicated to go in 59 steps. So I divided it into six phases of RNA, ribosomal RNA evolution. This blue helix right here, that is the very first or most ancient RNA of the ribosome, whereas the light blue comes later, and then the green, yellow, orange, and red. And the dark blue and the light blue form up pretty much the peptidyl transferase center of the ribosome, the catalytic center. Okay, so that last slide wasn't a complete picture of the ribosome because there's proteins. This is just RNA. So when you look at the proteins that I have depicted here in gray, you can see they're you know, embedded within the ribosome. And when you look at the, these structures of ribosomal proteins, you can see, once again, that there's a lot of tails on these globular domains of the ribosomal proteins. And, I would, and I'm gonna look at how, what pieces of RNA these proteins are interacting with. So when you look at these ribosomal proteins and what pieces of ribosomal RNA they're interacting with, you can see that the earliest pieces of ribosomal RNA are interacting with these tails of ribosomal proteins. Now, no, number, no ribosomal proteins are really interacting with this, um, the dark blue and light blue, the peptidyl transferase center. Like I said, that is strictly a ribosome, like RNA catalytic center. But when you move out from the PTC, you start seeing that the ribosomal proteins are associating with those pieces of RNA. And like Catherine said, the central core of the ribosomal RNA has been frozen in time since LUCA. And so what I'm saying is that you can extend that to ribosomal proteins. And that not only is ribosomal RNA frozen in time, but so is ribosomal proteins. And when you look at the ribosomal proteins that are interacting with the oldest pieces of ribosomal RNA, they're not really forming any structures that you find in life today, typically. They're usually very unstructured or forming beta structures, beta sheets. And so I've colored some ribosomal proteins by the phase of ribosomal RNA that they're interacting with. So remember, dark red is the most recent ribosomal RNA on the surface, and so dark red here is the most recent ribosomal protein, whereas you can go back in time from dark red to orange to yellow to green, and that's moving back toward into the ribosome towards the PTC. And when you look at these representative structures of ribosomal proteins, you can see that this green is forming pretty much unstructured polypeptides. And then the yellow, you can start seeing some um, um, beta strands. And then when you go to the orange phase five, you start seeing um, more globular domains, most, mostly made of um, beta strands again. And then when you go to phase five, this red, you start seeing alpha helices emerging and you see um, multi-dimeric multi proteins. So just to quantify that, um, you can see here in phase three, looking at all the ribosomal proteins that are interacting with ribosomal RNA at phase three, that they're all pretty much just unstructured coil. And then when you move to phase four, you start seeing some secondary structure forming, um, mostly beta strands, but then also some small little alpha helices. There are only three or four nucleotides long, whereas these beta strands are typically 10 to 20 amino acids long. And then when you move to phase five, you see more secondary structure, predominantly beta sheets. And then when you move to phase six, you see less beta sheets, but even more alpha helix, helices then. And so thinking about this, I'm a biochemist, I was just like, okay, this kind of sounds like protein folding. And so I presented this to my committee and they actually didn't really like it that much, but I guess I'll just show it to you really quick. Um, as I described earlier, the way that proteins fold, you first have an unstructured um, polypeptide sequence and then it forms you know, rudimentary secondary structures like alpha helices and beta strands. And then these beta strands and alpha helices coalesce together to form a globular protein. And so that reminds me of a protein folding funnel, but this is based off of thermodynamics, and I'm not really looking at thermodynamics. So my committee suggested maybe it's probably more like a genetic fitness landscape. So 
for instance, right here you have, um, if you have like a population of organisms and they might have all sorts of different types of alleles for their genes, um, the most successful reproductive success of these organisms is based on um, the alleles of genes they have and the ones that can um, go on to reproduce are the ones with the most favorable sets of genes in that population. And so this sounded a lot more like proteins with the ribosome and so my I said that, you know, proteins were created by the ribosome, on the ribosome, and for the ribosome. Like, the ribosome needs these proteins to fold correctly and to do its job correctly nowadays. Maybe the PTC doesn't actually need proteins to make, you know, pepti peptide bonds, but you need these ribosomal proteins now and current ribosomes to actually have it function and make the proteins we see in cells today. And so um, I constructed this, you know, protein folding fitness peak to kind of demonstrate that. Whereas up here you have, you know, large glidular domains of ribosomal proteins and proteins that the ribosome can make today. But going back in time, it probably wasn't making these large multimeric proteins. But if you start going back in time, you can see that the structure of the, pro the polypeptides it was making really didn't have much structure. And so, I guess, to our conclusions, ribosomal proteins expose the evolutionary history of protein folding. Like, this frozen in time, frozen in the ribosome. This process was chaperoned by ribosomal RNA, because as ribosomal RNA accreted onto the surface of the ribosome, the exit tunnel got longer and more functions were conferred to the ribosome, like decoding and elongation factors coming in. And so, first, we maybe had short random coil peptides that were being formed by the ribosome and then binding onto the surface, allowing more RNA helices to create onto it. And then we lengthened over time to coalesce into beta structures. And then we had like rudimentary globular domains and then large functional proteins on the surface of the ribosome today. And so the broad diversity of proteins in nature descended from a limited number of prototypes created on the ribosome, by the ribosome, and for the ribosome. And so that is what I say is the history of protein folding as evidenced by the frozen common core of the ribosome. So, yeah, thank you. I'm